and uh, we'll carry. So I'm very pleased to introduce tonight Marley Wakeling. She's our speaker. We've been trying to arrange this for about two years. Um, Marley graduated from UBC, where she studied visual arts. She taught art at Windermere High School, where she was the department head. She was a member of the Pescaderos Dive Club in Vancouver and a founding member of the Underwater BC Photographic Society, where she was president for a number of years. Marley is an award-winning underwater photographer and has been published in a number of books and magazines and by organizations such as the Smithsonian, National Geographic, and the Ocean Institute. So we're very pleased to have her with us tonight. Um, please join me in welcoming Marley. Welcome everyone. Today we're going to take a little trip halfway around the world to an area in Indonesia called Lembe Strait. Uh, there, it's a very hostile environment for marine life, and it's very different from what normally you would assume divers go to look at, which are pretty coral reefs, lots of pretty tropical colored fish. It's a completely different environment. The animals there and elsewhere in the world have undergone a lot of evolutionary adaptations in order to make life easier and survive and thrive in that type of hostile environment. So let's take a look where we are. So this gives you an idea of where Lembe Strait is. It is east of Singapore, south of the Philippines, west of New Guinea, and north of Bali and Lombok. So it's smack dab in the area of very diverse uh, marine life created by the fact there's tons of currents. The water exchanges here are more than many places in the world. And their currents going all different crazy directions, which will bring in plankton and larvae. And as a result, you get this huge biodiversity. It's also in the center of the Coral Triangle. So Coral Triangle is generally from the top of the Philippines down to Bali and over to the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. And this is an area that includes Raja Ampat. Some of you have heard about that as a hotspot for divers. So it includes huge biodiversity. It's right smack dab on the equator. In most of the areas, there's not much of a temperature fluctuation, but in Lembe Strait, there is seasonal fluctuation. So the island is just off the top of the, the red arrow there. There are some resorts that are on the mainland side and some resorts that are on the island side. And the strait that's in the middle is 16 kilometers long, two kilometers wide, and it bottoms out at about 100 feet. When I was putting this together, I was really surprised at that. I thought it was deeper uh, because you're not taken any deeper than that. I think I've been a little bit deeper than 100 feet there. But um, generally what you're looking at is at the north end of the strait, there are sheer coral walls and it's your typical coral reef diving. As you progress along the strait, they become shallower and more of a progression down to sand slopes. By the middle of the strait, you get your typical uh, lembe diving, which I'm going to do my, my dive briefing because I have it rehearsed. You have your sign with the dive map and you say, we are going to start at mini wall. Then we hit sand slope. Let's go dive. That's it. Because they're all, a lot of them are the same. Um, the bottom is sediment that is volcanic sand. It's not mud. Um, you'll hear the expression muck diving. There's no muck, it's sand. It's quite heavy. So if somebody kicks it up, it, it does settle back down again. First resort in Lembe opened in 1994. It was an American woman who was of Indonesian birth and she needed a project for her son who was a bit of a no-gooder. So they opened up a Kankungan Bay resort. And it was there until 2003 by itself. I was there in 2001. And what they did was they trained the locals, the young guys that lived in the area from the villages, how to point out interesting things to photographers. So they'd already done some exploratory diving in the area. And so they trained these guys and it revolutionized diving in a lot of areas of the world. Normally pre-guided diving, you had a dive master who watched you dive. And you'd be going along and they would they do this. They would just watch you. 
they're actively participating in your dive. They're a part of the photo experience for you. And they're finding things. And while you're photographing something, they're off trying to find the next interesting thing for you to see. Um, now there are dozens of resorts in Lembe Strait. I don't even, I've lost track. Uh, and they appeal to anybody that is a budget diver traveler. I don't know if there's such a thing. Uh, up to ultra luxury with your own plunge pool uh, at exorbitant amounts of money. It's a fabulous place for looking at little things. There are larger animals, but you don't see them because you're busy looking down. It's rare that there's a whale shark goes through or a manta, but it happens. There was one about, I think in November of this year or last year, uh, somebody happened to be looking up and oh my gosh, and had a point and shoot and could shoot wide angle and there was proof. So they do go through, but it really has been decimated by overfishing, particularly for shark species uh, and mantis as well. They'll take the rays for the shark fin trade. And as well as major shipping area. Lembe Strait is a, an area where there are freighters, passenger ferries, fishing boats constantly. There is a port right in the middle of the strait called Bitung, and it is a nasty port. Many ports are, not the nicest places, but the traffic is huge. And unfortunately, with that traffic comes garbage. Uh, when it is well monitored, they cleaned it up. During COVID, they did not. And so a lot of dumping occurred and hopefully things will turn around. There's lots of invertebrates, tons of little fish, uh, masses of nudibranchs, if that's your thing. And there's some unique and unusual animals that make it their home. Night diving is phenomenal. Uh, in my opinion, it's the best place in the world for night diving, um, anywhere I've been. So because this is a, an unusual environment, anywhere in the world, marine animals make changes through evolution. They change their behaviors, they change their visibility, their physiological structures in order to survive. It's like Darwin, you know, how his, he studied the birds and the Galapagos and their beaks changed to adapt to the diet um, on different areas of the Galapagos. It's the same thing underwater. Over time, things evolve. And some animals use more than one strategy, some just use one. But certain strategies have proven to work really well in the environment of Lembe. That's not to say it's the only place that these adaptations take place. They take place all over the world. But they're evident in Lembe because of the environment being out in the open, you get to see things more. It's not hidden in a, in a coral head. So the first one is sheltering. Lembe is notorious for sheltering animals in various man-made objects, but also natural objects. So you will get um, the fang blenny here is in a bintang beer bottle. You have the coconut octopus or veined octopus in a who knows what that can is. It could be an oil can, it could be a dog food can, I don't know. Um, and the other two are natural shelters. The first one at the bottom is a little lemon goby. It's very tiny. That's the remnants of a tube worm. Okay, so the tube itself is, I guess the hole is about a quarter of an inch across. Um, so four millimeters, three millimeters. So it's a very tiny little fish. The blenny is in a natural occurring hole in a sponge. Two others, the, on the left-hand side, you've got the damselfish, and it has not only commandeered this drinking glass as a little shelter, but it's also laid its eggs inside. So you can see around the whole circumference of the glass, those little white specks are its eggs. And then another fang blenny is in a can of Coke, and I love this one. If you look very carefully at the lower right-hand corner, it says, please recycle. And he's doing a nice job of that. Um, this is a snapping shrimp. And this is a sponge that's actually kind of fallen over a bit. A snapping shrimp are interesting creatures in that they are the ones that make the most noise underwater of any creatures. When you're underwater, it's not silent. There are lots of noises going on. And it, normally you will hear two predominant noises in Lembe. One is 
pop, pop, snap, snap, sounds like Rice Krispies. And the other is chirping. The chirping are damselfish and the snapping or snapping shrimps. How it works, it's cavitation in the water is amazing. It's such a fast motion that it creates a pop sound with its big claw. And they always have one big claw. Some of them live in sponges, some live in tunicates, some live in crinoids. They, they live in lots of different things, but the majority live in sponges and you'll never see them. They spend their lives hidden in the sponges completely. One of Lembe's favorite critters is the veined octopus. It's also called a coconut octopus. And the very first time I saw one, it actually did have half a coconut. Just walking around with it. Uh, but generally there aren't as many coconuts around anymore on the bottom of Lembe Strait, but there's lots of shells. And they will pick the shells and carry them around with them. And then if they feel the least bit threatened uh, with their suckers, they will pull them together and have a home. And I, this is a sequence of photos that started with him carrying and then settling down. And then by the end, there's just a sliver of an eye showing. They're not very big animals. Um, I would say the biggest one I've seen is about the size of a softball. Camouflage is when animals add things to their bodies in order to blend in as a means of defense. This picture on the left is not mine. It's the one in this presentation that isn't. Um, it's by a Norwegian dive guide I met there. Uh, this is a flower urchin. It's a type of sea urchin and it is highly toxic. You, you poke yourself with one of those spines, you go to the hospital and you're there for weeks. Um, they're really dangerous. What they do with their two feet, and you can see the two feet sticking out, is they grab things and they put them on top of themselves. Why would they do that? Think about it. If you're a fish and you like to eat sea urchin, what would you see when you're looking down? You're going to see a shell and some sticks and a bunch of stuff and rocks. You're not going to see the animal itself. So it's just a nice little mechanism that it's developed to hide itself from a predator. On the right, I love this little guy, but I call him the Smurf. He looks like a Smurf with his blue hat. Now, this is a sponge crab and it's a baby. It hasn't quite figured out what it's supposed to do. Sponge crabs have adapted their back legs and they, they fold them in a very odd position behind their heads and they hold a piece of sponge as camouflage and they'll wander around with it. And some of them get huge pieces of sponge. This little guy has made the mistake of picking a tunicate or a sea squirt instead. I guess you grab what you can, but I think he's adorable. He's very small, um, probably the size of your thumb, including his hat. Crustaceans are really big on decorating themselves. They seem to be the group that does it the most. Um, the hermit crab on the left, they come out at night. He has decorated his shell with two different kinds of anemones. At the top, the ones with the spots, um, they keep on the top. They are for defense. So all anemones have stinging cells, so it's going to be protective. But interestingly enough, by his mouth, there are two other anemones. Ooh. And those are the same anemones. If you're familiar and you're a diver and you know what a boxer crab looks like, they are little crabs and they hold anemones in their claws, like a cheerleader. The same species of anemone that this guy has. And they're now thinking that they're not for defense, they're to attract food particles. Anemones are sticky by their very nature. If you were to touch one, you're not gonna go, ow. Um, the sting isn't powerful enough to really hurt you. They feel really sticky. And so their food particles in the water column are adhering to the tentacles of the anemone and it's right by his mouth. So it's very convenient. Kind of like a little vacuum cleaner. On the right, it's another kind of decorator crab. And this is called a candy crab or soft coral crab. And he's an interesting fellow in that right here on the top of his head, there are a series of sharp barbs. They're much like Velcro. And he will pluck pieces of this soft coral and stick them to his head. This one doesn't have much on him. And I'm, I would theorize he's probably recently molted. And if you're a decorator crab, you have to redecorate. 
every time you molt. So you shed your exoskeleton and now you're going, uh oh, I'm naked. I've got to put new clothes on and they have to redecorate. So often you'll see them and they're quite covered with soft coral. The creature on the left uh, is called an orangutan crab. He doesn't have a scientific name. They thought he was something and they've changed their mind now. So he doesn't have a scientific name at this point. He also has these barbs. You can see them here and a bit here. And instead of soft coral, he sticks algae all over himself uh, as a disguise. Ironically though, they tend to hang out on bubble coral. So they're not really very disguised at all. So if you want to find an orangutan crab, all you have to do is look for bubble coral. You might not find it on the first one, but you'll eventually find an orangutan crab. That's where they live. They don't tend to live anywhere else. On the right, we have another crustacean who's a decorator crab. And this is a really interesting creature in that he has these long spines that come off of his head. There's two of them. And what he does is he snips off pieces of hydroid and sticks them to these little velcro-y like attachments on either side of the spine. So he's kind of somehow got one stuck on his head. They're not normally there. What's interesting about this is this hydroid is actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Brooding. Um, these are gametes, so it's gonna hatch eggs. Okay, so it's in the process of reproduction. So these will burst and larvae will go into the water column. So the hydroid benefits, the crab benefits because he's very well camouflaged, not only with the hydroid, but he's evolved to have this stripe pattern, which really matches the branches of the hydroid itself. Mimicry is my favorite thing about going to Lembe. And I always tell my guide, please, that's what I'm interested in the most. And so they are very good about really showing things that you're interested in and taking pictures of. So mimicry is when an animal poses as a different animal to either hide from or discourage a predator. So for example, on the right, there's a nudibranch and this nudibranch has this lovely pajama stripes. It's a very toxic nudibranch. Uh, being the, in the family that it is, it has a lot of chemicals that it takes out of sponges and they're acidic and quite poisonous or toxic. The flatworm is not toxic but it has adopted the pattern and the color of the nudibranch to hopefully convince a predator to leave him alone. These two are, I was so shocked when I realized it wasn't what I thought it was. I took a picture of this animal and then when I got home and on the computer, I went, wait a minute, it's not what I thought it was. These are completely different animals. They're both nudibranchs, but they're totally different families. The one on the bottom is highly toxic. Um, it's a group of nudibranchs called thalidids. I call them lumpy bumpies because they always have bumps and they're lumpy. So I thought I was just taking a picture of a, a regular lumpy bumpy, but then I noticed it had a gill at the back. Thalidid nudibranchs do not have gills at the back of their bodies. They're on the side and underneath. Mm -hmm. So this nudibranch that is not toxic has evolved to look like a nudibranch that is in order to discourage a fish from eating it. Quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Here are some other animals. Um, this is a mollusk, it's an allied cowrie. And the cowrie has a skin, it's called a mantle that envelops the shell. So what you're looking at is not the shell, it's flesh. And it has developed these bumps that look exactly like the closed polyps of the coral that it lives on. So this is a, a whip coral. So imagine if you're a fish and you're looking for a meal, it'd be pretty tough to find this guy. He's blended right in. As well, here's another um, mollusk, is this nudibranch has also decided to look like the closed polyps of the soft coral in which it lives. So you've got the body of the nudibranch. These are its rhinophores, their sensory organs. Um, this is part of its mouth down below, these sticking out, the oral tentacles. 
but it has these sticky outy bits or serrata that have evolved to look like the soft coral that it lives on. As well, the pattern on it mimics the stripes on the body of the coral. And I thought to myself, well, why is it that these animals always mimic closed coral polyps rather than polyps that are open? Well, when a predator comes along and bumps into the coral, the polyps all close. So that's when the animal needs the most protection and disguise from being uh, mimicking what it's on. These are both, in both cases, it's food source as well as where it lives. This is a, another crustacean and its mimicry is phenomenal. They're really hard to find. I, I think I've found one on my own ever. They come in orange and pink and purple, all these different colors. They always match the sponge that they live on. And they always seem to be, uh, there's usually a pair of them around, uh, probably somewhere else on this piece of sponge, there was another one. But their bodies have developed this pattern so that it looks like the little holes in the sponge. Quite, quite amazing. This is probably my favorite nudibranch. Um, really difficult to take the difference, but see the difference between what it's living on. So here, here's to point out, these two lines here are its rhinophores, okay, sensory organs. This is the nudibranch. This is a serrata, or it's the appendage that sticks out, and it has evolved a ball of flesh on the end that looks exactly like a closed coral polyp. So these are the polyps open, but right here, you can see one that's starting to close. So you can see how it has mimicked uh, to look like it. These have not been known about for a long time. Uh, this one is probably was described about maybe 15 years ago. It's because A, no one was diving in this environment, and B, how did you find them? Uh, and I, you know, I give photographers hell when they put a picture up of a nudibranch and it's sitting on a rock and it's got a black background and I'm like, yeah, you, you've moved it. It's obvious you've moved it. They have no desire to sit on a rock. This is where they want to live because it's, they're vulnerable. They're hidden when they're on their food source. They're not hidden when they're on a rock. This is a shrimp, a commensal shrimp, and it has evolved a pattern to blend in completely with the pattern on the coral. The little red spots um, I was very curious about. So I sent them to a shrimp person I know, and he said, I have no idea. And I've seen one other picture of this. It's a parasite of some kind. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what it is. I've never seen another one of these shrimp with the spots on it. Another animal that wants to live in this Xenia coral, um, and this is a swimming crab, and swimming crabs have adapted their back claws and they're like paddles so that they can swim easily. And what's interesting about this species is that when it's on the Xenia coral that has the brown cilia here, it develops this pattern. If it chooses to live on one that's white, it doesn't. Same animal, same species. One will grow the pattern and the other one won't. It's, go figure, it's all about blending in. So in the fish department, uh, these are ghost pipefish. And a ghost pipefish is somewhat like a seahorse, but it doesn't have a prehensile tail like a monkey. So it's not grabbing on to anything to hold on. So they're free swimming. They can't get anywhere very fast. So they needed to develop a means of protection to avoid predation. The first one that's on the left uh, is a halimeda ghost pipefish, and it mimics coral and algae. And you can see it in the background. And this coral and algae is kind of like little scallop shapes, okay, that are linked together, much like the tail and the dorsal fin, and it has lines on it. And so this animal has developed the same patterning of lines as the algae that it lives amongst, uh, and they blend right in. 
This ghost pipefish does not have a name, scientific name. Uh, they call it a velvet ghost pipefish, and it mimics sponges. There are actually two in the photograph, and the one in the back was uncooperative, this one here. And this is the male. Um, with many species, you'll find that the male is smaller, marine species. <laughs> male is smaller, the female is bigger. Um, but they come in different colors that match the sponges that are around them. So either um, I've seen them in pink, I've seen them in a purple, and I've seen them in this red color and in a green. So this is a special little animal that was thought at first to only live in Lembe. Um, it was discovered in 2007. I went to Lembe in 2008 and I immediately said, I need to see this animal. So Johnny, my guide, and I snorkeled at night in the dark. They're very shallow. They weren't discovered because nobody was diving in the areas that they're found. They're found in kind of the murky sediment covered stuff that hangs in off of the coral in the shallows. So you'll find them to about 15 feet deep at the most. Um, they're generally around five. And to give you an idea, it's two centimeters long, but I love what someone told me. If you type the name in a 10 point font, it's longer than the animal. <laughs> So well, that gives you an idea. And they're like a hair. So they call them a pipe dragon. That's really not any kind of official name. Uh, it's really a pipe horse. And the difference between a pipe horse and a ghost pipe fish is the pipe horse has a prehensile tail. It wraps itself around a holdfast. And that's what these do. You can see here, the tail is winding up this piece of algae and they hang like a monkey and they just kind of do that, <laughs> swing around. Um, some people think they're ugly. Some people think they're cute, but they have managed to evolve this mucky looking body that looks like the sediment that is all around them. Um, so they blend completely in. And I did see it when I did go to find it. And I did get a picture. So I was pretty pleased because um, that was, I was, pretty novice photographer then. Another one of the famous lembe critters is the hairy frogfish. It's an anglerfish. So as an anglerfish, it has this filament here, and it has a lure, which we call an esca, on the top. Every frogfish has a lure of some kind, and they're all unique to the species of frogfish. In this instance, the lure looks like a worm, and I have once sat and watched one and I bl almost blew my regulator. I was laughing so hard. So the lure comes down and the ends of it unfurl. And it's like one of those gymnasts with the ribbons. And they do this. <laughs> and it's way in front of its head. So an unsuspecting animal is fascinated by it and comes along to check it out and boom. The frogfish inhales the fish or the shrimp, whatever it is that was investigating it. Um, they're hilarious critters. They're not uh, all that big. They will range in size from this as babies that you'll see up to about like that. Gives you a bit of an idea. This is another kind of frogfish, and it's probably the most common frogfish in Lembe Strait. It's a painted frogfish. They are masters of mimicking different things. Sorry, I missed to say what the hairy frogfish is mimicking algae. So you'll get sargassum and stuff that falls to the bottom and that's where it lives. So it looks like the algae. The painted frogfish tries to look like various things. This one is trying to look like a sponge. So it's even developed little spots to look like the siphons on the sponge. It also has a lure that you can see. I was always told that a painted frogfish lure look like a shrimp and I couldn't, couldn't see it. I'm gonna point some things out and then you'll see why they say that. So right here, head of the shrimp. There's two little pokey things sticking out. Up comes the back of the shrimp and the tail comes down. If you know what a broken back shrimp is, 
Um, for example, like our candy stripe shrimp here, it's that same type of body. Watch this. That's the shrimp type that it is mimicking. There is a, another one in this group of shrimp that's pink or sort of a magenta color. And that's the one I think it's probably trying to mimic. This little guy uh, is a relative of what's known as a hairy shrimp. Um, for a while, they became very trendy for guides to find. And I remember saying to one of my guides, I don't want to see any more hairy shrimp enough because they're so small that you get a headache trying to find them. I mean, this guy is at most four millimeters, at most, probably smaller than that. It's mimicking tunicates. You can see them in the background in this lime green and they have the white frosting kind of um, pattern on them. And that's what he's doing. I call them a wasabi pea shrimp because they look like the little peas that you get in the Japanese cracker mix. Another example of mimicry, crinoid shrimp. They develop these amazing patterns that match the feather stars that they live on. And holy grail of octopus uh, in Lembe is not the mimic, it's not the wonderpus, it is the hairy octopus. Um, and this is a hairy octopus. They are about this big. Okay, size of your little finger. Uh, they're very rare, but October, November is when you'll find them. Um, it's one of the reasons that's the time of year I choose to go. This guy is the expert of mimicry. Uh, yes, it's the same guy that was living in the beer bottle earlier. Um, and it is a false cleaner fish. It is actually a fang blenny. And a fang blenny is called that because it's got these two very pointy, sharp fangs on the bottom and a matching set on the top. It has evolved to look exactly like a friendly, harmless cleaner rat. So fish will set up a cleaning station. Usually there's something sticking up piece of coral, little promontory sticking out, and they will hang out and that's a signal for fish to come and get their gills cleaned. The fish like it to happen and the cleaner rashes know that if the fish comes in, they're not going to be harmed. This jerk <laughs> hangs out. Cleaner rats swim like this. He's adapted that, so he swims like that too. Fish comes along, he goes into the gill and takes a chunk out. So he's a bit of a nasty piece of work, but what an amazing evolutionary adaption that he's done in order to survive. And here's our mimic octopus. So the mimic octopus is very famous in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it has this beautiful pattern on it. Uh, it has the white, if you're, if you're a diver and you wanna know the difference between it and the one that's similar, look for the white edge along the arms. It has white suckers as opposed to orange. It's called a mimic octopus because it's thought to mimic other creatures. I think, think people got a little carried away with interpreting the mimic octopus's behavior. Some of it's a bit of a stretch, I think, but it made for great press. It was all in the news and National Geographic. So the first picture here, uh, the mimic is supposed to be impersonating a snake eel. The second, it's supposed to be impersonating an anemone. Hmm. Third, which I've seen, is supposed to be uh, impersonating a flounder. So here's a flounder, a sole to compare it with. Frankly, all octopus swim like that. They all get flat like that. I don't know. Uh, this one is supposed to be, the one here is supposed to be impersonating a lionfish. Hmm. And lastly, uh, a snake. And I've actually seen them do this. And they do look like a snake because they only have two arms sticking out. We'll see. You know, it makes for a great story. But they're very clever and they're very aggressive hunters. Apex predator. This guy was from my last trip. And he's coming at me and I am backpedaling and I kept backpedaling and he just kept coming at me. I think he might've been seeing his reflection in the port of my camera because he just, 
<laughs> he just wouldn't stop. He just kept coming. I finally had to just kind of back away, uh, but he was in active hunting mode. So um, this is kind of covered by that, but there we are. Um, Aposematism is a term used to describe how uh, there's adaptations that have been made in physical appearances using color or pattern to warn a predator that you you know I'm I'm going to taste bad if you eat me. Uh, I'm going to poison you if you eat me. And nudibranchs are, are big practitioners of this. This type of nudibranch, again, it's a lumpy bumpy in my terminology, um, has a bright orange coloration and a bullseye circular pattern. It is highly toxic. If you were to just put this in an aquarium, everything would be dead by the next day. They sequester toxic chemicals and release them when threatened. I've seen it once and it looked almost like a squid inking um, where this stuff came out of the nudibranch and it's very poisonous. This animal is not poisonous, but it's adopted this bright orange coloration to say, and the big polka dots to say, back off, if you eat me, I'm going to make you feel really uncomfortable or kill you. Ironically, this is a cannibal nudibranch, and it eats other nudibranchs, even its own kind, but it is not poisonous. Two other examples, a non-poisonous nudibranch who's adopted that bright orange again and the striped pattern. Interestingly enough, this species of nudibranch can have stripes or it can have polka dots, both the same species. They've just, there's two different versions of it. This one is another lumpy bumpy, and you can see the white spots all the way along the edge of the mantle. These are the glands that contain those toxic chemicals. Um, so I've once seen one of these nudibranchs with a bite out of it. Uh, I'm sure it just got spat out, but it managed to survive. Um, two other types of sea slugs. These are chromodorids. They have these beautiful bright colors. They're the colorful ones. Uh, there was a scientist who said he liked nudibranchs because they looked like they were dressed up to go to a party. Um, both of these are, are toxic. They eat sponges and they sequester those toxic chemicals. Uh, coloration for defense. Uh, divers who rage on about how wonderful flamboyant nudibranchs are, that's what this, are, this is, um, only think of them as being in this color. That's because the person that has been pointing it out to you has probably harassed it before he's shown it to you. So this is a flamboyant cuttlefish at rest, uh, being pretty happy. And this is one that's like, I don't want my picture taken anymore. They get this bright, bright coloration and it happens instantaneously. It's really fast. So that's really common for some animals, particularly moths to do as they they have this warning color um, that they will present you with. And often on a cuttlefish, they'll have patterns that come up. And it's amazing when you watch it because it looks like it's moving on the animal. Mm -hmm. um, most poisonous octopus is this little guy. You don't find them using because they blend right in until they get agitated um, by interference or if they're hunting, um, this guy was hunting and his color was really, really bright. Uh, so I, I guess maybe he's excited in whatever way, if they get excited, then these blue rings come out. And if you get bit by one, you have 15 minutes. That's it, you're gone. This is another poisonous octopus and it's called a matoti. It has one blue ring. This is the same animal. In about a minute between one color and the next, it was fast and it was in stages. He turned actually a dark burgundy with a white stripe first and then went to this bright yellow. Um, and there were a lot of divers around, so I think he was probably a bit stressed. But this blue ring again is saying back off. Um, I don't know how poisonous these are, but I suspect they're probably just as poisonous as the blue rings. So to give you an idea uh, of how color can affect things, um, 
many animals underwater, and that's true anywhere in the world, have evolved a lot of red and orange coloration because the wavelengths of light, red and orange light, don't penetrate very far. And so I wanted to give you an idea of what it would look like without my flash or without your flashlight, what it would look like at depth, so below 30 feet, below 10 meters, what would it look like if you were an animal on the hunt? So I have this ornate ghost pipefish, uh, another ghost pipefish, different species, and they have this broken pattern which breaks up their body outline. And so animals will do that with bars, with stripes, with dots, because that breaks up that fish shape that another animal might be hunting for. So you can see by removing the red and the orange, what you're left with. If you squint at the picture that's on the right, kind of all blurs together into a bunch of squiggles. Scorpion fish uh, are real proponents of reds and oranges on their bodies. If you think about here, a red Irish lord is a perfect example. It's uh, similar to a scorpion fish. And they have a lot of red and mottled coloration that breaks up their body outline so they look like the substrate in the bottom of the ocean. And you can see even here, there's some coral and algae in the background. And the scorpion fish has got a pink nose, much like the same color as the coral and algae. Again, that outline of it being a fish disappears. These are ambush predators. They wait for an opportune moment and they open their mouths and grab something. So they don't want to be detected. Their color can change like that. I took a picture in the Philippines of the same species as the one on the left. He was bright reds and oranges. He did not like that. He got up and he sat down on a piece of sort of algae covered stuff and he turned green. Literally, Within 20 seconds, you would have never known it was the same animal. So they are quite able to change their color um, as a means of defense. Mm. This guy uh, has <laughs> lots going on. Uh, this is a box crab, much similar to a Puget Sound king crab that we have here in BC. Uh, their other name is a shame face crab, which I love because it's like, I'm so ashamed, I'm gonna hide my face. Um, he has developed patches of different colors with the red, and he's got all these hairy things that stick out, much like those hairs that the other animal, other um, decorator crabs stuck things onto themselves with. He's got those growing on him, and they have attracted a lot of sediment. So if something's looking down on him. He's just going to look like the bottom of the ocean. He's out at night. Many of these creatures that do the red come out at night. Um, apparently they're delicious. So I hear. And speaking of delicious, this is, these are both taken on a night dive. This is a prawn. And this is the species that if you have frozen shrimp, these are now cultivated. Uh, this is the species that you eat when you're having your frozen shrimp from Save On Foods. Um, they're quite big, this big. Uh, and this guy is a baby box crab. He's just, he's in here because he's adorable. Mm -hmm. And he's just, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> but again, he's on a night dive. He's out at night. During the day, he would be hiding. The red just is one other advantage that he has to not be seen. He would just look like these black blobby rocks all over the ground. He's going to blend right in when there's no white light illuminating him. This guy's masterful. Uh, this is a crocodile fish. It's a member of the scorpion fish family. And his pattern has this reticulated, gorgeous pattern. And he has matched what's in the background. And it's a, it's a primitive anemone called a coralomorph. And it has a lot of algae living in it. And so he has kind of adapted his coloration, so he blends right in. Again, he's an ambush predator. He doesn't want to be seen. If he moves and goes somewhere else, he's going to change his color to match whatever background he's on. Breaking up the body outline, a lot of fish will do. This is a common lionfish, and you can see it's got stripes on it and bars, and that's to break up its outline. He's an apex predator. Um, if you've heard, they're invasive now all over the Caribbean. 
And he doesn't want to be seen. So he'll hang out in an area where there may be some whip corals or gorgonians. And so his body is broken up. The white will show, but the dark will not. These are the, the sharks that you will see in Lembe. Um, they are bamboo sharks. This is a baby uh, and it's a brown bamboo shark. He's black and white when he's young and he will turn a brown color as he ages. And this is a spotted bamboo shark. Um, I, amazingly, these pictures were taken in exactly the same place within maybe a foot or more, six years apart. So obviously bamboo sharks like this particular dive site for some reason, I don't know. It's my favorite dive site in the world. If you've been to Lembe, New Falls. So another octopus that is uh, a bit of a mimic, this is called Wonderpus photogenicus. It's got the best scientific name of any critter. Uh, finally, a scientist named something fun. And it's Wonderpus with a, oops, sorry, with a U, uh, not an O. It was a German scientist who named it. And um, it's a voracious predator. It's similar to the mimic octopus. It has this beautiful pattern that breaks up its body. Uh, again, you can tell it's not a mimic because it has the orange along the bottom where its tentacles are, or its suckers are. And it doesn't have any spots. And a mimic octopus always has spots on it. Um, here is him doing an impersonation of a snake eel, if you want to believe that mimicking theory. So false eyes, is there any way I can get rid of this bar across the top? It just doesn't want to go away. No. Yeah, sorry. That's... It's there? Yeah. Okay. Um, some animals, particularly fish, develop false eye spots. So uh, this one is unusual in that it's developed two. And this is called a twin spot goby. It's sometimes called a crab goby because when it moves back and forth, it kind of looks like a crab with two eyes. And an animal will aim for the spot thinking it's an eye. It's gonna do a lot less damage if it hits a fin than if it hits the head and the actual eye. So it's just an evolutionary strategy that animals have developed. Here are two other examples. This is a baby parrotfish. It will be bright blue and two feet long when it's older. Now it's about two centimeters long. Uh, and again, it will go for the eye spot if a predator is going after it. This has also broken up its body with that bar. So it's kind of a disjointed pattern on that animal. This is a lembe frogfish, fairly newly described species. It has, again, a spot on the back of the dorsal fin for that same reason. It's just to fool a predator into aiming for the wrong end. This one amazes me still. This is a baby wrasse. I have no idea how it made an eye spot that's iridescent, like its eyeball. No clue, but it's amazing. Um, some animals have developed hard bodies and spines and the ability to inflate their bodies to deter predators. Um, thorny seahorse that is quite common in Lembe uh, and it has these sharp spines. It can't move very fast, so it needs to have something to defend itself. So it also generally tends to latch onto a pink sponge. So it blends in, the colors blend together. It's not so visible. But this is a file fish and you can see it's got its spine erect. Fish are generally swallowed tail first. It's not gonna go very far if that's sticking into the inside of the throat of the fish that has swallowed it. Uh, this is a balloon fish. I think they look like E.T. You can see he's being cleaned by a cleaner shrimp. Is that a cleaning station? It has two things going for it, lots of spines and the ability to inflate. This one has been harassed by dolphins. Dolphins like to bounce them around like beach balls. And this was the only way of defending themselves. Um, the one time that I've seen this diving was in Socorro on whichever the site is that has all the, the sharks sticking in the hole. 
you know, broken partita. Broke partita. Broke partita. Thank you. And there was this puffer, and I'm like, what the heck's going on? And the dolphins, <laughs> they've been playing with it. Okay, a couple of other. This is another puffer. Again, this one has the ability to inflate. This is a box fish, and a box fish has hard, bony plates, and it wouldn't be very appetizing. It's its only protection. They literally, they, they have little tiny fins. They can't move very quickly at all. I'm doing good time here. Getting there. Um, safety in numbers. These are a rigid body shrimp fish. And a shrimp fish has lots going for it to protect itself. It's got the color red. It's got a stripe down it that breaks up the body and these white lines that break up the, the body outline. Um, and if you're traveling in a school and you're this guy at the back, you're probably pretty safe. Somebody on the outside of the school is going to get eaten before you. So they've got a lot of things going on here to protect themselves. Commensalism and symbiosis is something that a lot of inverts use um, and some fish use. It's kind of a win-win situation. The urchin in this case uh, gets cleaned. The shrimp gets sort of the leftovers that get stuck on the spines. This is a, a fire urchin, it's very toxic. This particular shrimp lives at the base of the fire urchin. So where the urchin meets the sand, it's right on the edge. There's another shrimp that lives on this urchin that you'll see in a moment. This is a, a commensal shrimp that lives on bubble coral. When I'm bored and I can't find anything underwater, I look at bubble coral because I know I will find one of these shrimp probably. And at least I'll have something to take a picture of. Most famous commensal animal are anemone shrimp, um, anemone fish. Uh, there's a couple of things going on here. We've got a commensal shrimp on a commensal fish. Mm -hmm. So the shrimp is cleaning the anemone fish and it is on an anemone. Um, the animal, the fish gets, um, protection, it develops immunity to the stinging cells. It actually becomes a component of the mucus on its skin. And the anemone gets protected because these guys are vicious. I have scars to mm. prove it. Uh, this is not Nemo. Uh, this is a false anemone fish or false clownfish. Uh, how you tell the difference, they look exactly the same. One has more black. Uh, and Lembe supposedly is in the overlap zone where you'll have both species. I've never seen, I've never seen the true uh, clownfish in Lembe Strait. Maybe they're there. This is another type of anemone fish. For up until very recently, it was considered in a separate family than the rest of the anemone fish. It's now had its name changed and it's in with everybody else. It's called the spine cheek. It has a sharp spine right over top of its gill cover. This guy is the most vicious creature in the sea. He is called a saddleback anemone fish. I have a scar to this day on my hand. And when I came out of the water, blood streaming, the guides laughed at me. <laughs> Nemo, <laughs> you got bit. They're really vicious. They're about this big. They're really tiny. Um, this is the male, and he is aerating the eggs. Uh, he was blowing water over them to oxygenate them, keep them healthy. And in two weeks, they will hatch. So these are the same species, uh, but the eggs up close. These are minuscule little creatures. Very few survive. One is obviously not. Uh, but out of this mass that is laid, maybe one or two will survive uh, because they get into the water column and other creatures eat them. So that's why they lay so many eggs. Um, another kind of seahorse that you'll find in Lembe Strait is a pygmy seahorse. There are three species that live there. These are two of them. Uh, the first one is the giant of the pygmy seahorses. Uh, and it is about this big, centimeter, maybe centimeter and a half. And this one is about that big. They live commensally on a particular sea fan, and that is the only place that you will find them. This particular one on the left comes in two colors. It comes in yellow and it comes in red. 
and the CFAN is either yellow or red dependent. They can change color. So if they do happen to move to a new fan, I have a photo that I took, my first pygmy seahorse photo of this species, I took in Lembe Strait, and it was halfway in between yellow and red, and I didn't know that that was anything to be interested in. I just thought it's the way they came. This one, again, just like these other creatures, they are mimicking the closed polyps on the Gorgonians. So on this particular one, when these polyps close, they look like a little lump. You can see one right here. And on this one, they retract completely. So this particular seahorse has developed spots to match the spots that occur on the fan. These two critters are the same species. They're totally different colors. They have adapted to their host that they live on. So. So this is the emperor shrimp on the left. He's living on a sea cucumber and he has developed this dark, dark reddish orange to blend in when there's, if there's no white light, you wouldn't see him at all. He would just blend right into the sea cucumber. This one has developed the spots to match the spots on the enormous giant Spanish dancer nudibranch. He's chosen to live in an area of the anatomy of the nudibranch. This is the anus of the nudibranch, and this is where he's chosen to live. You can theorize why that is. <laughs> right, here are the other shrimp that live on that fire urchin that's so toxic. These are called Coleman shrimp. This is the female, this is the male, again, that size variation. They come in varying intensities. These two were phenomenally bright and gorgeous. Um, and sometimes they're a bit paler, but they always live in a pair and they clear just like they're in a, in a forest, they want to clear a patch for camping. They clear off some of the spines so they have a nice little bear patch to hang out on. Again, they benefit from any kind of sediment or detritus that falls onto the urchin. And the urchin probably doesn't get any benefit at all in this situation. And they're immune to obviously to the venom that the urchin has in its spine. Another animal that has questionable taste in where it chooses to live. Uh, this is another swimming crab, and it chooses to spend its entire existence in, on, or around the anus of a sea cucumber. Um, and they will go in and out to hide. I guess, you know, some creatures got to do it. <laughs> this is a, an anemone shrimp. It's commensal with anemones, but it also will hang out with other creatures. Uh, particularly uh, snake eels, it will hang around, or tube-dwelling anemones, it will hang around um, because it wants to advertise that it's available to clean a fish that comes along. So it likes to hang around things that stick up out of the sediment. And this is how big they really are. So this is my dive guide getting a manicure from some shrimp. And they came in and we're having just a great time doing its cuticle cleaning off any dead skin. So they just a, a concept of how tiny they really are. They're quite small. Another um, strategy that animals will use is to live actually in the sand, down underneath the sand, uh, or they'll build a den. Most of them that do that are nocturnal. They'll come out at night. These are swimming crabs and they have come out at night to mate. When you find them, it's astounding how quickly they bury themselves. This is heavy sand. It's not like, you know, tropical island, white, fluffy sand. It's heavy stuff. Literally in a second, all you'll see are two eyes sticking up. They can bury themselves that fast. This is a spearing mantis uh, shrimp. It is the largest mantis shrimp in the Indo-Pacific. And there are two kinds of mantis shrimp. There are spearers and there are Smashers. This is a spearer. You can tell by the shape of the eyes. The eyes on a mantis shrimp are highly complex. They're like an insect eye. They're compound eyes. Apparently, their vision is phenomenal. Uh, they have one of the fastest times of an animal movement of any creature on the planet. And that movement is boom, I've got you. And with this appendage, and this is, you can see it here, its elbow is below the sand. And this one will come out 
and wham, and it gets a creature. Lives in a den. You'll see them out, but they generally hang out in the den and there's not usually their body sticking out. It's usually just their eyes sticking out of the hole because they don't want anyone to see them. Um, the other kind of mantraship has a round eye and it's uh, a smasher. These are, are known by fishermen as thumb splitters mm -hmm. because if they get caught on a fishing line and they try to take them off, they can literally split open their hands. They're very interesting animals. Another animal that lives uh, buried in a den uh, is a shrimp goby. There are lots of different species of shrimp goby. This is a particularly interesting one with its pattern. They live with a shrimp. So this shrimp lives in the den and keeps it clean. And you'll see them, they're like little bulldozers and they'll be, they'll be rolling out little stones and keeping it nice and tidy. They're like the gardener uh, for the den. And they live, uh, sometimes there's two shrimp in a hole, sometimes just one, uh, but they're usually together. And it's, it's certain species of shrimp that generally tends to live with certain species of shrimp gobies. Uh, this is a jawfish. Jawfish uh, come in various sizes. This particular one is one of the bigger ones in Lembe. I would say its head is oh, mandarin orange size. He's doing a threat display, trying to look bigger. And the only way he can look bigger if he's in a hole is to open his mouth. You rarely see them out. I've seen them out a few times. Um, they're quite long. They're about a foot long. They're mouth brooders. Uh, so if you're really lucky, you might find one with eggs in its mouth and you'll actually be able to see the eyes of the babies in the eggs. Another critter that's quite well known from the Indo-Pacific is a ribbon eel. It's called a blue ribbon eel, which is kind of ridiculous because it is in three different colors. When it's uh, a young animal, it's black and it's male. As a young adult and adult, it is blue and male. And, oops, and as it ages, it turns yellow and it turns into a female for reproduction. Many fish change sexes. Anemone fish are another one that do that. I have only seen a yellow one once. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of black ones and blue ones. I don't know why. I wonder maybe they go deep. Um, I have no idea, but you just don't see the yellow ones. This is a snake eel and you can see there's an anemone shrimp that's decided that he's turned it into a cleaning station. So that's why he's hanging out on his head. He's advertising to the fish that this is a cleaning station, come by and I'll clean you. This is a garden eel. They're usually a very shy creature. They're hard to get a photo of because they withdraw into their den. And they're usually in a number of them. This species is one that tends to be solitary, but usually you'll see a field of garden eels and you get close and they all pull in and you back up and they all come out and it's tough to get a shot of. This is everybody's nightmare. Uh, this is a stargazer. It's an ambush predator. It lives, lives buried in the sand. Its head is shaped like a shoebox. It's very blocky. And its face is right at the top. I was so shocked the first time I actually saw the whole fish because it's way bigger than the face. And the face is tiny and it's way up on the top of its head. Everything else is buried. They have a lure like a frogfish, but it's inside the mouth and it looks like a worm and they will wiggle it and attract something and then just bring it out of the sand and gulp it down. They're pretty ugly. So neuter banks are my thing. Um, and so I thought I'd show a little bit about what of these techniques they have used. Uh, they're hermaphrodites, they're sea slugs. They've lost their shell as they've evolved. Uh, and they've developed some pretty extraordinary strategies. Uh, in Lembe Strait, we did a, a survey to prepare for a workshop that I was doing there on nudibranchs. And we decided to find out how many different species of nudibranchs had been photographed. And we had to have evidence of the photograph. So we scoured the internet. And those of us that are really into it, scoured all our photographs. And in 2016, we came to a, a total of over 600. There, I'm sure there are more. Um, but the, the diversity there is 
quite incredible. Um, these guys are called nembrothas and they live on sea squirts or tunicates. And they're using that aposematism with the pattern and the color to warn off predators, though they're not poisonous at all. These two happen to be mating. You can see that the reproductive organs are on the side of the animal. And so they have to go head to tail when they're mating. Chromodorids are these really bright ones we've talked about. They sequester those chemicals from the sponges that they eat, but they also have these bright, bright colors to advertise the fact that don't eat me. I'm gonna poison you if you do. <clears throat> Some new brains use mimicry. Both of these have done that. The one on the left, um, is called a phylodesmium, and it is a nudibranch that has algae in its system, zooanthellae in its system, and it mimics the soft coral on which it lives. The one on the right is also a chromodorid. It looks very different from the ones that were on the page before. It is mimicking sponges, and oops, we were very excited. It's really rare. Uh, it's the only one I've ever seen, um, but it looks just like the sponges that are around it. Uh, with these spiky bits that stick out, uh, quite phenomenal. Here we have a type of nudibranch that's mimicking a sponge. It looks just like it. There are the eggs underneath. And this one is another philodesmium that's mimicking soft coral. Again, it's, it's developed these appendages that look like the closed polyps of the soft coral. More lumpy bumpies, uh, again, they have the toxic chemicals. Uh, again, they have these white bumps that are along the bottom on both of these, you can see, highly toxic uh, acids that they store in their bodies. This is what we call a solar powered nudibranch. They're very big as far as nudibranchs go. One of the largest ones. And you can see these little brown patches that are all over its body and all over the serrata or the appendages that are the respiratory appendages. It just increases the surface area of the animal so it can absorb the oxygen. What's amazing is that this zooanthellae that lives in these, just like it lives in anemones and corals, it undergoes photosynthesis. So these animals gain energy from another creature living inside of them. I mean, what an amazing strategy uh, to develop. So they capture the sunlight, it converts it into energy. So they're basically acting like a plant, even though they're an animal. And so that's why we call them solar powered. So there's another phylodesmium, and you can see it also has zooanthellae in it. This one, I've photographed it probably a dozen times and doesn't have a name, nobody. We know it's a philodesmium, but it, no scientist has ever described it. Aelid nudibranchs, again, philodesmium have these serrata sticking off their backs. These also do. What's really interesting about this type of animal is that it has been able to develop the ability to eat the stinging cells from anemones and hydroids, ingest them without the stinging cells firing. They pass up the digestive tract and end up in the very point at the end of the serrata, and it uses them for defense when another animal attacks them. How cool is that? These are both relatively new, uh, new to science, nudibranchs. They've just been named in the last year and a half, two years. Oops. And this is the craziest one of all. This nudibranch uh, is called Chromodorus colmani, around Lembe, you see them all the time, you see them in the Philippines. About five years ago, there was a study done in the Atlantic where the scientists discovered that nudibranchs on various islands had evolved to look completely different and mimic exactly the most common species in the area. And the same animal developed four or five different forms on all these different islands, including the Caribbean, the Azores, um, just amazing. And I said, when I read it, I went, wow, 
that's got to be true in the Indo-Pacific. There's way more nudibranchs there. Sure enough, they did some sequencing, DNA sequencing, and they have discovered that, in fact, it's happening there, which makes identifying nudibranchs much more difficult. So this is what a Chromodorus colmani normally looks like. There he is there. If you go to East Timor, which is near Raja Ampat, it is developed to look exactly like the most common Chromodora nudibranch in the Indo-Pacific, which is called Chromodorus anae. But it isn't. Genetic testing proved that it was this species. If you go to Queensland in Australia, they have developed to mimic a common nudibranch there called Chromodorus burney that has stripes on it. And if you go to Western Australia, they have developed a pattern that looks like the most, one of the more common nudibranchs there, but they're all genetically identical, which is just astounding to me. So in closing, uh, this is a solar powered nudibranch. I'd like to know how many animals you can see the test. So what we've got going on here is we've got the solar powered nudibranch. We have an emperor shrimp that's going for a ride right here. Believe it or not, you'll have to take my word for it. There is what's called a sexy shrimp right here. And then we have a file fish whose coloration has blended in with the stripes on, I mean, it's just amazing to me. Um, and I was so mad when I had this, I had this really crummy little point and shoot camera because I was shooting video. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't have a good camera. But I just thought it was amazing that it's really a, a great example of how animals use every strategy they can uh, to survive in that environment. So, question. So you have time for a few questions if you're in the audience, just uh, gladly so that people at home can hear. And at home, you can either put your questions in the chat or uh, we have a speaker here, so you can unmute yourself if you like and just ask your question directly. I could pass through a great ten. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no question. That's a, just a, someone's chat or uh, no questions. No questions. Wow. I have a question. Yeah. It's sort of camera. Okay. And housing, and I mean, what kind of a rig are you carrying? On Huge. <laughs> um, I'm using a Nikon D five hundred. In an aluminum housing, all Canadian, all the quad cut, manufactured in Montreal. And then there are two big arms that come off it, and there are two that kind of flash on each arm. Uh, the entire rig weighs about 35 pounds. But underwater, it's actually pretty neutral. It's two pounds an angle. But it's it's a big bus. And you're shooting when you're there in a place like I would think you are set up for macro. I'm totally set up for macro. I shoot 99% of the photographs I take are with a 105 micro, uh, micro Nikon macro lens. But on front of my setup, I have magnifiers. So the field of view that I'm usually shooting is less than half an inch by half an inch. Do you have one other question? Yeah. Um, as some of us are, are you know, being more advanced age diving, do you also have a, a mask that yes. has uh, eyeglasses in it? Or yeah, mask? I, in fact, I just ordered a new one. Um, I, I had a mask for years that I love, which is made by a company called Sea Vision, and they have acrylic lenses, so they're very light. So you don't feel like you have a mask on. Problems on my last dive trip with it. And I, my eyes are getting worse for close vision. So I just ordered a Tusa mask with 
stronger readers. To get a mask that has a full bifocal is about $800. So I decided that my distance vision isn't that bad. Oh, it's just got the, the post. It's just got readers on the bottom, yeah. yeah. And, and I've used that for, I had laser surgery when I was in my late 40s, and I instantly couldn't see underwater. I cried when I saw a underbrain that was a blur. And so I went, oh no. So I got readers then, and I've used them. They're great for finding them. It's incredible. Some of the, the tiny little creatures that you've been able to not only see, but photograph by them. I think I went to Bali in May and I was so thrilled when I found the little green shrimps myself at night mm -hmm. that I thought, oh, I have really accomplished something. <laughs> they are, I mean, they're so. <laughs> but I mean, the guys will point out stuff to you that is so infinitesimally small that even I, I'm going, huh? And you point and go, what? And you look through your camera and you're kind of doing this, trying to find it. And then finally, oh! <laughs> and it's like something that's two millimeters long. It's just nuts. And that's too small for me at this point. Yeah. yeah. What's the average of photographs that you actually keep compared to what you take? What, what, which is your... No, it's idea? funny because I don't photograph like other people photograph that have not... I was trained on film. So I had 36 exposures and I could sometimes get 37. If I shoot over 100 photographs on a dive, that's really rare for me. And that's a really good dive. Um, I really take a lot of time thinking about what I'm doing ahead of time. So um, I would say on an average trip, I would come, let's say I go for 12 days, I'll come home probably, I might take maybe 2,000 pictures. I'll end up with 300. Yeah. Let's just say at this point, I'm still editing 2018. <laughs> Because I have to come up with the Latin name for everything. How many times have you been to that dinner? Oh, God. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. 2001, 2008, 2009, 2011, 2014, 15, 16, 18, 22. I think. No, there's one more in there somewhere. I've done, I think it's 10. Yeah, they're going there since 2001. And it's really, I mean, the amount of resorts now. When I went there in 2001, I won the trip uh, for a photo contest, and it was phenomenal. Like, they sent me a, a certificate that said, uh, seven nights accommodation, zero dollars. All of your meals, 24 hours a day, zero dollars. Gratuities, don't even think about it. And there were four paying guests at the resort. And eight people diving the entire Glen That was it. Now you get eight people on a dive site. To their credit, now they limit the number of boats on a particular site to you know, two. That's it. Place that I go, you start diving at 7:30 in the morning because you know nobody else is going to be competing to the site you want to be at, which is always getting up early for. Yeah. Uh, how many dives have you done on that boat? Your favorite place to dive? Uh, how many dives? About 1,700, I guess. And my favorite place is probably Lembe and Bali. Those are the places I seem to go. Um, I like Indonesia a lot. I like the culture there. The Philippines is also really good. I'm going to the Philippines in, in March. Um, I find the culture not as interesting. It was very Americanized early on, so you, you don't get the different traditions, but diving there is beautiful as well. What about the Caribbean? Uh, I've been all over the Caribbean. Uh, <laughs> it's brown. It's brown. <laughs> Just brown. Yeah. I went to Bonaire because it was the first place that was open when restrictions started to lift. Yeah, it's okay. There isn't the invertebrate life. 
that you've got in any of the There's a question. If yeah. you click the chat, chat. It's a long question. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I think that take me short. Oh, I should be saying, yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, the color changes uh, on a lot of animals, uh, nudibranchs, for example. Uh, many of their color changes with what they've eaten. Uh, absolutely. Um, with the shrimp, uh, because that shrimp hasn't even been described, uh, nobody's had a sample get to the scientist yet. So nobody has sampled that, like the green one. Um, I don't have the heart. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Um, mollusks, I don't think so. Uh, like, I mean, not mollusks, pardon me. Cephalopods, like um, cuttlefish and octopus, I don't think their pigment is coming from that. They have, they have chromatophores in their bodies. Uh, but certainly some of them do, yeah, good question. Could I ask a question, please? No, I guess not. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, great photograph photography there, Marley. Um, given your uh, the size of many of the organisms that you're finding and photographing and having to get pretty close, uh, given the strain on the eyes, about how long are your dives on average? Um, it depends on where you are. Um, there are restrictions in a lot of places that restrict dives to an hour. Uh, and Lembe, uh, when you know the resort owners and the guides well, uh, you tend to be able to dive long. Um, I've done 80, 90 minute dives there. Oh. And it's you have to obviously have air, <laughs> but uh, generally what we do, the dive pool hole there is you'll go deep first, hunt for the rare stuff, and then head to the shallows and spend the majority of your time in the shallows, because that way you see more and you have a longer dive. Yeah, I guess what I'm thinking with, with um, uh, you're, you're having to spend a, a fair amount of time, I'm assuming, to zoom in on your on your specimen or your species, whatever, uh, do you find that it does strain your eyes with a, with uh, by the end of the dive? Or are you pretty? No, because I'm uh, using a mask that has prescription uh, lenses in it. So that makes a difference then. Oh, in terms absolutely. Of eye strain. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. If I didn't have some, I would definitely have eye strain. Mm hmm. But incredible photography, just amazing. Um, not necessarily, but I have been, because I've been doing um, group trips, um, I've been going to the same resort since 2014. Um, part of that is cost. Part of that are the guides. There's two guides that you saw at the beginning of the presentation. That picture was taken in 2008. That's when I met Oko and Johnny. Um, they're much fatter now <laughs> and older. She, most of us are. Um, but they they shifted from the really high end resort uh, to one that is a little more reasonable in cost. Uh, and it's right next door. You're going for the same dive sites. Anyway, so if you want the plunge pool and you want to pay, you know, eight or nine thousand US for a stay somewhere, then be my guest. But I would rather pay, you know, a third of that and stay longer. Yeah, no point. Yeah, um, I've stayed at um, there's another resort uh, called Black Sand. It is owned by a guy from Vancouver who married a woman from Sulawesi, and her family is very wealthy. So they built a resort, and it's just lovely. Um, it's, it's quite a bit smaller than the other ones. I think there's six six bungalows, um, which is really nice. I don't go to the big resorts. That have, there's one that has 60 rooms. Like, no thank you. Um, I prefer a much smaller resort. The one that I go to has 15 rooms, but the five rooms at the top of the resort are more expensive usually empty. So there's 
is usually maybe at the most 20 people. They have three votes, and there's eight or nine people uh, on each vote. And the other reason I go there is that most resorts do three to one or four to one ratio of a guide to divers. The place that I go is two to one. And I often have an uneven number of people in my group. And so I get the extra. So it's, it's, it's quite wonderful to have your own guide. Um, and I've, I've done that in Bali. I've, I've actually hired a private guide. And it maximizes your opportunities because you're, you've got that one person who's looking just for you, not looking for anybody else. And they know what you like as well, which is a huge part of it. You know, I have to tell the guides where I go. Can we please look at something aside from the events? I have to tell them, no, I like other things too. <laughs> yeah. Well, where do you publish your photos or the videos? Um, they're picked up. It's funny. I just got a, a notice today, actually. Um, there's a magazine, website, newsletter out of the UK. It's on, based on science. Uh, and they published a picture yesterday of uh, coral from Lembe. I just got the email before I left to come here. Um, a lot of my stuff is in children's books, uh, educational stuff, which I'm real happy about. Um, there's been a number of books that have come out in the last year, like The World, Atlas, of, you know, Seaweeds of the World, and Frogfish of the World, and all the, all the world books. Uh, there's a lot in that. Yeah, there, as I say, it's... Uh, um, National Geographic was one time a really nice thing, which was sadly about Granny the Orca uh, when it was surmised that she had passed. Uh, it was a photograph that I took actually out with Joan uh, on one day, and Granny came right up to the boat. And it was, I mean, I was so lucky. Um, so, you know, it wasn't in the magazine, it was on their website, but it went. All over the world. Unfortunately, just because it goes all over the world doesn't mean you get any money out of it. <laughs> Do you write any stories with it or any blogs? I used to actually. I used to write for scuba magazines, but I haven't done that for ten years. Uh, it just uh, when the big economic downturn happened in two thousand eight, it really hit the magazine industry hard because the first thing that you lose are advertising, and so they cut their rates. So they paid. Dramatically, and I just decided to do it with them. No, I mean, I, it coincided with when I retired, so that's sort of when I mean, I, I still, I mean, I, it's fine to find myself. It's really hard to get anything monetary out of photography anymore. Um, digital killed that. Really. I mean, I, I, Joe and I were talking about it. You know, like, if you break, a hundred bucks for a picture, you're doing really well. It, it's like you, I mean, I, I see some of the people on the stock you didn't see one of the stock agents they work with, and like they're complaining because they're selling their pictures and they're getting more sense. Yeah, it's crazy. But you know, I'm, the children's books pay well, and I'm, I'm happy that you know, for educating children, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.